Hey, uh, welcome everyone. Last week, uh, if you're new with us, we kicked off a brand new series in the New Testament book of 1 Peter. And when we say 1 Peter, we're talking about the disciple of Jesus. Uh, We believe he wrote this letter and wrote these words to encourage Christians 2,000 years ago uh, as they were trying to figure out how to do life in what seemed like an increasingly chaotic sort of world. And so we're calling this series Field Guide. What's a field guide? Well, a field guide is a resource that's been prepared to help equip uh, and guide the traveler, especially as they're working their way through what seems like some unfamiliar territory. And that's what 1 Peter then is for us as Christians. And when we say Christians, that's all of us. It's young people, it's old people, it's you know true whether you're single or married, if you're working or if you're retired, if you're new to your faith or, or old to your faith. First Peter is a guide for us. It's encouragement for how to live. Uh, it's an instructive work to show us how, how to live and to go about our lives here in this world. And last week we talked about what it meant for Peter to call these Christians exiles. If you remember in the first couple of verses there, uh, he refers to us as exiles. Some translations use different words. You'll find the word aliens or strangers uh, or foreigners or sojourners. An exile is someone or describes someone who takes up residency temporarily uh, in one place even though their desire is to return to ultimately return to their true home one day. And so Peter, that's his way of saying that's what you are as Christians. This is what you are as a follower of Jesus. And this is true 2,000 years ago when he wrote these words. It's true today as well that we're like exiles in this world, meaning that this world is not our permanent home as followers of Jesus, that it is a temporary place. And so in other words, Peter would say, don't get comfy here. Right? Don't, don't get too cozy. I, I think Peter would say, don't just blend in either and pretend that this world is all there is. And, and don't get caught up in the American dream or get distracted by the things that in the end aren't really significant, don't really matter. And I don't want you to withdraw either, I think he would say. You know, I just, this isn't about just hiding out. I, I see people doing that today. There, there are people that are like, whatever with this world, I'll just find my tribe, I'll find my people, we'll withdraw as much as we we can, and we'll just shelter in place until it all comes crashing to an end. And that's not helpful either, according to Peter. That misses the point and the purpose of what we've been called to as followers of Jesus, as Christians, as exiles in this world. And as exiles then, Peter wants to inspire us. All right, he's here to motivate us, to inspire us, to cast a vision for what life can be like, that as exiles fully sold out to Jesus Christ, then we have the opportunity to contribute in ways in our world and in our communities and where we work and in our schools and in our neighborhoods to contribute in ways that actually make things better and to bring glory to God through it all. Uh, I think back to God's encouragement to the people of Israel as they were forcefully taken into exile by the Babylonian Empire, going all the way back to 586 B.C. And through the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning in verse 4, here were some of the instructions that God had for his people. He said to them, verse 4, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, uh, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down there. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. He says, pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And not without acknowledging the tension. Because we've seen a little of that already, and that's going to come in the weeks uh, to come as well. Peter acknowledges that there are challenges to living in this world today, but at the same time, he keeps reminding us, you're not here by accident. You're here for a reason. God has us here for a reason. And one of those reasons, as we like to say around Genesis Church, is our mission is helping people find their way back to God. That's the work that we've been called to as followers of Jesus Christ. But we need some motivation, right? Right? And Peter knew then 2,000 years ago with a group of people that were going through some really difficult, challenging times that they needed some motivation and encouragement. And that's why Peter reminds us. Last week we talked about this. We're going to see this thread all throughout the series where he refers to our motivation as the living hope of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ as our living hope is all of the motivation that we need. Think of it as a fixed reference point. All right, a fixed reference point. 
It reminds me of my favorite amusement park ride as a kid, all right? This is going way back. How many of you remember the Scrambler ride? Anybody a Scrambler ride fan? You know, round and round you go. I loved this ride as a kid. The State Fair in Springfield, Illinois, and, and this thing would just whip you around, and you were so dizzy when you got off of it. And then some years back, I went to Disney World with my kids. This is going way back. You see my son Joel there. We were on the teacups, right? Similar ride, no big deal, sort of same concept or whatever until that thing gets moving. And uh, my father-in-law was with us, and he could kind of see from my eyes that I was about ready to lose my Dole Whip uh, all over the teacup. And so he reminded me of the importance of find a fixed stationary object off in the distance. Like, get your eyes focused on that. It can help with the motion. And sure enough, it, it worked. Last week, we talked about Auschwitz survivor Viktor Frankl. Uh, he wrote a famous work, a book called Man's Search for Meeting, where uh, he studied and interviewed a number of people that actually survived Auschwitz and, and comparing those who healed and recovered versus those who could never make it, couldn't make it through, and, and those that maybe took their lives and, and really asking the question, what made the difference? What was the difference? And, and what he found was it was those who had a fixed reference point beyond this world. Uh, they had their eyes on something greater. They, it wasn't just what this world could offer, but for us as Christians, we know, and what Peter is stressing here is that it's Jesus. That's Jesus for us. He's our fixed reference point, you know, beyond this world. He is our living hope, and with Jesus, then we know that, that he's with us now, but we also know and believe and hang on to the truth that he's going to come again, and that's why we live, and that's how we live in this world. Today, I want to talk with you a little bit about what it means to live as exiles here, not just to serve. Survive. Again, we're not just hiding out, and we also don't want to blend in, but what does faithful living for Jesus look like in this crazy, chaotic sort of world? And so I hope when you came in today, maybe you picked up one of the field guides. We ran out of these last week, uh, but I believe we still have them available by both doors. And so if you didn't get one on your way out today, this is our gift to you. This is just kind of a personal study guide throughout the course of the series, uh, kind of a chapter for each week of the series, and some questions that you can answer on your own and read along with us and maybe a tool to take with you to your connection group if you're following along with this series too. But I want to read for you today out of 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. I'm not going to put the words up on the screen just yet, uh, but if you've got your own Bible with you and you want to follow along, you can. Or if you want to just turn to, I think it's page 8 in here, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. We've also included the NIV translation of these particular verses. Uh, but let me read for you. 1 Peter Chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, here's what the Apostle Peter writes to Christians then and to today. He says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as He who has called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy." Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake." Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God." For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this, Peter says, is the word that was preached to you. 
And so the question, what does it mean for Christians? What does it mean for us to live in this chaotic world? Uh, I want to look at a group of imperatives, kind of commands that Peter has for us as Christians and what it means for us to live each day. And this is not a complete list. This is just really the beginning of a long uh, list of imperatives throughout the course of this letter. But I want to identify four pleas or commands for Peter for us today. He begins in verse 13 put the words here on the screen, we read again, therefore, Peter says, with minds that are fully alert and fully sober, uh, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Now, you've maybe heard this before, but anytime the, you see the word therefore, you need to ask the question, what is it there for? And it's often a link or a connection to what has just been explained. And for us, it's what we talked about last week. Peter, uh, it, it triggers us back. It's his way of saying that, hey, because we're exiles, and because our fixed reference point is the living hope of Jesus Christ, now here's how I want you to live. He says uh, to begin, number one, if you're taking notes, ready your mind. Peter says, I-, I need you to ready and prepare your mind. Think of it like this. If you're an athlete, it's like you need to get in the zone, all right? You need to get your game face on. If you're a, a musician, if you're in a, a marching band, you know, you mentally, right, prepare yourself for the performance that's coming. Maybe you've got a big presentation at work this week. It, it, it's one thing to prepare the presentation, but then there's the mental side of it. And so you imagine yourself in the moment. Peter says, if we're going to live faithfully for Jesus Christ in this world, we need to prepare our minds for action. It's a phrase that when translated also means, get this, to gird up your loins. Gird up your loins. Turn to the person next to you right now and say, hey, don't forget to gird up your loins tomorrow. No, don't do that. I'm just saying that's awkward. Let's not be like that here at Genesis. That's really weird. But here's where that comes from. It's a phrase. Back in the day, uh, men see wore these long outer robes But if they knew there was a fight before them, if they knew they might need to run, if they knew they might need to react quickly, they would take that outer robe and fold it up and they would tuck it into their belt. They would gird up their loins so that they were more agile. It was a sign of readiness. They were prepared. Not surprisingly, Jewish men would do this as they ate the Passover meal each year. It goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 12, verse 11, when God commanded them. It it symbolized their readiness. Uh, They were ready to be used by God, ready to respond to God, ready to go with God. Peter might choose a more relevant phrase today. He might say, roll up your sleeves, you know, get in the zone, get your game face on. Why? He doesn't want us to get distracted. There's just too many things in this world that can, can steal away our attention. And so he says, keep your mind sharp. You know, we we need to make sure that God's word is influencing our lives and not just the latest belief system, the latest idea. You know, Peter also uses the image of drunkenness. A, A drunk has little to no control over their mind. Peter says, don't be like that. Stay alert, pay attention, you know, discipline yourself and keep Jesus. The living hope is your fixed reference point. And remember, we're not supposed to just blend in either, but we're not hiding out. We're here to serve Jesus. We as Christians, we serve and we follow someone so much greater in this world. And as we'll see later in our reading, there are going to be times of suffering. Jesus warned us about that. And he also reminded us that we're living in the midst of a spiritual battle, that there are other things going on in this world. But no matter how difficult it is, the living hope of Jesus reminds us that we're not fighting as Christians for victory, but we actually fight from a place of victory. And we know that victory is ours and we can fight and live from that place because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and his resurrection and all of the promises that are to come. And because he gave his life and because he saved us, the second command is this, that we are to walk in obedience. Verse 14, Peter says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Look at verse 14 when Peter says, I don't want you to conform to the ways of this world. See, we're, we are exiles. We're foreigners and strangers here living in this place. And that means we live by a different belief system. All right? We, we follow a different authority. And so that means that there are going to be times as Christians that we stand out and, and people are going to hate us for some of the things that we believe. You know, but as Christians, as Peter stresses, we're called to this life of holiness. 
Now, that word for holy there is the Greek word hagios, which always reminds me of Greek class back in college. I took Greek, uh, and it was at 7.30 a.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays in college, which is a really difficult time for a class, See if you know what I'm talking about, if you, if you went to college. And, and Dr. Shively, who taught Greek for us, loved Greek, and he loved the Lord, and he loved teaching Greek at 7.30 in the morning. And so one of the things that we did to, to open every class is we sang the famous hymn, Holy, 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 and we sang it in Greek, and we sang it every morning, Hagios, 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 and you better participate because your participation certainly influenced your grade to some degree or not. The word holy means to be separated or to be cut away, and God is holy, is what Peter says in other places we read in Scripture, which means he's not just holy like, and he's not just the best example of holy, but he is holy. God is holy holiness, and it means that he is different, it means that he is unique, it means that he is diff- uh, perfect, that there is no sin in him, and that he can't tolerate it. And so holy, we know, I mean, it's certainly not an attractive word uh, in a place like America today. We don't use it often. It, at the same time, it doesn't fit the prevailing culture or belief system that says it's all about me, and it's all about what I want, and it's my body, and it's my feelings, and whatever's important to me, or I'll do what's best for me. God's holiness means that he is completely separated from evil, that there's nothing at all profane about him. But while he's holy, he's also incredibly beautiful and full of grace and full of love all at the same time. I mean, think about it. What kind of holy God would send his son Jesus into this world? And speaking of holy, Jesus was holy. I mean, we believe that there was no sin in Jesus' life, that he lived a perfect life, that even though he came to this earth as a man, he lived a perfect life. He lived life the way life was intended to be lived, and he never sinned, but he died for those sins. He died for your sin, and he died for my sin. And just as the living hope of Jesus then should and can motivate us and influence the way we live, Peter says, so too the holiness of God. You know, his holiness should energize us. It should move us to action and move move us to obedience. And that's why he says command number three is to fear the Lord, to live a life as exiles and Christians where we fear the Lord. Verse 17, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope or in God. Notice there in verse 17, you might even underline it in your field guide or in your Bible, those words reverent fear. And that word fear is a tricky one, like because none of us wants to be afraid or likes the idea of being afraid of someone or something. I, I was thinking back to when I started kindergarten as a little kid, and I've got some memories of, of being in kindergarten. I remember Mrs. Harris. Mrs. Harris was my kindergarten teacher, and one of the things that I'll always remember about Mrs. Harris is that she would periodically do uh, headstands in class just to entertain the class, and she was a sweet, wonderful woman, probably had no business uh, doing headstands you know, in the class for us as students, but I wasn't afraid of Mrs. Harris, but I was afraid of Mr. Camille, and Mr. Mr. Camille was the principal at our school. And again, I had no reason to be afraid of Mr. Camille, but it was just kind of ingrained in you that you didn't want to go to the principal's office. Like kids went to the principal's office and never came back, right? And so you never wanted to go there. And so walk the line, you know, stay in line, and all you do, watch yourself. That's not what reverent fear means, though. Like this isn't about being afraid of God. This is more of an awe of God. And this kind of awe drives us to surrender. And we start reflecting on His holiness like we want more of Him in our lives and we want to live obediently and we're ready to lay down every part of our lives for Him. We lay down our our time at school. We lay down our our time going away to college and even see these seasons of our lives as another opportunity to surrender our lives to Him. We Our calling, our our careers, our homes, our finances, you know, our retirement. Like we, we, we say, God, this belongs to you. And so we surrender and we surrender 
surrender out of a reverent fear. It's kind of like giving 100% for a great coach. You know, if you've ever played for a great coach before, like you, you step out on the court, the track, the field, you're, you're ready to give your awe for that coach, that all for that coach. And in the same way, God sent his son for you and for me. Like, why wouldn't we give and live for him? Or, you know, Jesus died for me. He, he laid down his life for me. He's called us. He's called me to do the same. And because he's holy, I want to surrender and serve and live as if he were living through me. And that's really the aim. It's more of Jesus through our lives that when people see and experience us, in fact, what they're doing is they're experiencing Jesus. Fourth command, last one, is Peter's urging to love one another. Verse 22, he says, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. There are so many good things in so many of these verses, and we're not touching on all of them. It's one of the reasons why, you know, a personal study, even using something like the field guide, can bring so much more to life as you read and study on your own. But Peter says, again, he reminds us that Jesus died for you. You belong to him. You find your identity in him. And so in light of now, you're growing our growing knowledge uh, of the awe and holiness of God. Again, he stresses, love one another. You know, Jesus said, you know, I'll tell you what the most important commandment is, to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, and you love your neighbor at the very same time and in the very same way, that our love for God should be reflected in the way that we love each other. We love God vertically, but we love horizontally as well as we love one another. Jesus taught these things. Peter used the word deeply. It's a word that means to strain to go the extra mile, to give everything that you have. We're called to do that as Christians. You know, we're called to do that as we love one another. And and I love the way that I see that happening in our church family. Um, I I love the way that I hear of connection groups, you know, serving and caring one another, especially when maybe somebody's going through difficult times. Told you a few weeks ago, our, our Carmel campus pastor, Jerry Neville, his wife, Casey, a little over a week ago, had surgery to remove a non-cancerous tumor from her brain. It went very well, by the way, and she's recovering at home and recovering well. They have been so overwhelmed by prayers and gifts and care from the people of our church family. I mean, that's getting to what Peter's talking about. Like, you love one another. We, we hurt with one another. We go through trials and difficulties with one another. Again, I love what I see God doing in our student ministry. You know, and the community that God is building and forming around our students and how they care for one another, but how they're also loving and caring their peers and their classmates and people that God is putting in our lives. That's the aim. That's what Peter's getting at. We love one another, but it goes beyond our church family. Peter commands us to love others, meaning the people we do life with each and every day, the people that we work with, your neighbors, again, your coworkers, people that you interact with all day long are just opportunities to share the love of Christ, to serve others. And I think if Peter were here today, I think he'd say, hey, you know, when you run into some challenges and you run into challenges with people, I'm not asking you to agree with them, right? Because we're not going to agree with everyone. I, I think he'd say, you know, I'm not, I'm not even suggesting that you do life with them regularly, but you can love. Like that's what we can be known for. I, I think he'd say this, Christians can be the best and the greatest example of what it means to love others and something like that. I think what Peter, we're going to see, is going to say, like, something like that, that kind of love has the potential of getting the world's attention like nothing else. We remembered the terrible events of 9-11 this past week. Always causes you to remember if you were alive at the time, where you were, and what that was like. And, you know, in the midst of all of the horrible things that happened that day, there was plenty of good 
that happen too. I was getting my hair cut the other day and I heard somebody make a reference to a red bandana. You know the red bandana story? I didn't know the story. I went home that evening. I was watching Sports Center and they played a, a little story that started out, it caught my attention right away about Wells Crowther and his red bandana. I was like, oh, I just heard about this. What's this about? Maybe you know this story if you don't. From the time he was six years old, he wore a red bandana, took it with him everywhere. It just became a part of his identity. Even at the age of 16, when he volunteered at his local fire department to serve alongside of his dad, that red bandana was always with him. Well, he eventually went on to play lacrosse for Boston College, uh, and he would tie this red bandana around his head. He'd wear it underneath his lacrosse helmet, but as he later graduated and took on the job as an equities trader working on the 104th floor of the World Trade Center South Tower, he took the red bandana with him every day. It was always in his pocket. Jack Alexander wrote this about Wells Crowther. He says, and it was with him on September 11, 2001, when United Airlines Flight 175 exploded in the South Tower, cutting a fatal path between floors 78 and 85, several four floors below Wells. There was a young woman, a woman by the name of Lynn Jung. She was blown back by the explosion. She couldn't see anything at first out of her eyeglasses as they were covered in blood. When she wiped them off, Lynn saw a world of nightmare. There were mangled bodies all around her, dust and debris everywhere. And then she saw a young man through the smoke, ash, seemingly more shadow than flesh. And he just kept saying, I found the stairs. Everybody follow me. And Wells led Lynn and others down 17 flights of stairs to where firefighters led survivors down another 20 floors to a set of still working elevators. But Wells didn't go with them. He went back up. He went back up, a red bandana wrapped around his nose and mouth to fight off the smoke. He found Judy Wine in the rubble. Her arm was broken, ribs were cracked, one of her lungs was punctured. Again, Wells called out, anybody who can stand, stand up now. If you can help someone else, do so. And Wells led Judy and a group down the stairs, again to a band of waiting firefighters. And then he went back up again. And he didn't make it out of the South Tower Perhaps he never expected to when it collapsed. His body was found six months later, surrounded by the bodies of uniformed firefighters. And in the months to follow, a number of survivors kept telling the story of a young man with a red bandana tied around his mouth who worked tirelessly to help people down and out from the tower and many believe now that he is credited with saving at least 12 people that day. And he's gone, but his bandana isn't. It's part of the 9-11 Museum in New York City now. And it's become a symbol of heroism and sacrifice and one who gave his life so that others could live. And we know, and Peter would say in an even greater way, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. And Peter stresses, do you know what the world needs? Not only then, but for us today, it needs Christians. People living and sold out for Christ, loving and serving each other, serving the people that God has put around you each and every day. And our motivation is the resurrected Jesus. It's the resurrected Christ, the one who is our living hope, the one who gave his life for us and we're called to give our lives for him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us a savior in Jesus Christ and for his perfect life. And he laid it down and he gave his life as a demonstration of his love, your love, Lord. And we thank you for the promise that in Jesus and through Jesus and through faith in Jesus that sins are forgiven that we are redeemed and that we can find our hope for living in this world no matter the circumstances, thanks to Jesus. And thank you for calling us to a greater purpose as Christians, as a church, as people, Lord, to follow Jesus as our great example and his motivation, Lord, to serve and to honor you that in the same way we are called to serve and honor you, to serve and honor the one who laid down his life for us. He laid down his life for us. 
And Lord, it be my prayer and our desire that that would be our motivation today to live, to serve, to lay down our lives for you, but also for the sake of others. Show us what that looks like, God, even as we leave here in just a moment, this afternoon and then the week to come. Would you show us what it looks like to live for Jesus so that others might know and serve you? We want to see many more find their way back to Jesus. And so we trust you. We trust you with all of our lives. You have everything that we need. We praise you and thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.